Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the Health and Welfare Subcommittee. As co-chair of the Health and Welfare Subcommittee of the African American Task Force, and in accordance with the passage of House Concurrent Resolution 85, adopting rules of procedure for conducting virtual meetings of the General Assembly and its legislative committees during an emergency, this public body is authorized to meet virtually. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant of House Concurrent Resolution 85. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for this virtual meeting. All members of the Health and Welfare Subcommittee have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and participate in this meeting by registering via the meeting link that is posted on the General Assembly's website. The public has access to watch and listen to this meeting through a live stream available on YouTube. A link to this live stream can be located on the General Assembly's website or by searching for the Gen Delaware General Assembly YouTube channel. Should any subcommittee member experience technical difficulties during this meeting, please call 302-519-4629. Public comment is permitted at the close of this meeting. Public attendees in the Zoom webinar must utilize the raise hand function to be permitted to speak and shall be called on in the order in which their hands were raised. Members of the public will be unmuted and informed that they've been allotted two minutes to speak. Public comments can also be submitted in advance of and up to 24 hours after this meeting by emailing African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note, that any votes that may be taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's begin today's meeting by taking a roll call attendance of the subcommittee members present. Subcommittee members shall ensure that their cameras remain on for the entirety of the meeting to the best of their ability. When your name is called, please unmute your device and affirm your attendance. Once you've been recorded as present, please mute your device for the duration of the roll call. So we are going to move on to that roll call now. Gore V. Rodriguez. Ray Jones Avery. Monica Shockley Porter standing in for Ray Jones Avery today. Thank you. Carmen Jordan-Fox. Present. Eleanor Kiesel. Present. Simone Philpotts. Present. Debbie Harrington. And then she said she'll be joining us later. Cassandra Coase Johnson. Present. Forrest Waxon. Present. Keith Hunt. Keith Hunt. No. Nakisha Williams Bailey. Present. And Colleen Davis. Present. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. With a quorum being present, each subcommittee member's identity has been authenticated by the chair. So we will move on. Uh, first thing we're going to do is um, take a motion to accept the meeting minutes from our last meeting. Has everyone had an opportunity to review them? If so, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to accept. Thank you, and a second? Second. I took a This is So a I have Cassandra Coase Johnson as um, the, making a motion to accept the minutes and Dr. Carmen Jordan Cox seconding. Actually, I, I wasn't second, I had, a, I had a, two corrections to the minutes. So. Oh, okay. Did you want to review those corrections now? Sure. sure. Under uh, what I introduced, my introduction, uh, it's uh, it noted that uh, that vast experience in higher education was missing. So in it higher be, education. And noted 
her vast experience in higher education and within the state. And then the second sentence is um, from a family of four doctors. It's actually four generations of doctors. Just so. Can you repeat that second part? Four generations of doctors. OK. So. I just want to ask the staff, were you able to get that? Yes, thank you. OK. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes with those changes? Motion to accept with those corrections. Motion to accept from Cassandra Coase Johnson. Do I have a second? Second. Who was that? Nikisha Williams Bailey? Yes. Second. Thank you. Okay, we shall move on. So I know everyone received an email. We are ready to get into the meat of this subcommittee and start to look into the topics that we are going to explore and um, look at what we have, break them down into areas that, that we need to and group them together as needed along with looking at what other subcommittees are doing that may be related to um, the topics that we come up with. So we have asked every subcommittee member to uh, share their top priority topics. We asked for three top priority topics related to the disparities in health and welfare in our state. And before we move forward, I just want to state the purpose of this subcommittee is to identify areas of racial and ethnic health disparities in our state, including mental health, and in implement solutions and policies to improve the health and welfare of Delawareans. Um, with that being said, I will go ahead and move on. We don't have Glory V, but we do have someone filling in for Ray Jones Avery. Um, Monica, were you able to, did she um, give you the three, her three priorities to share with the group? Yes. So um, for uh, NCBW's uh, priorities for uh, this uh, coming year, um, we're looking at November to April, um, the focus being on um, Black women and girls as it relates to um, COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19. We also have um, a program, which is 100 Bridges a program where we work with um, students uh, within the state of Delaware. So we're also looking to reach uh, Black girls through the um, 100 Bridges program and then also um, talk with them about self-care and also uh, COVID-19 and how it's affected their learning, um, their academics, their family life. And then that third priority, um, along with just the mental health and physical aspects of COVID-19, COVID-19, um, the third priority being Black maternal health um, continues to be a priority um, for us as well. Um, to add to the health aspect, we did just have um, a program last week um, regarding uh, breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer um, as it relates to um, the disparities in Delaware specifically um, related to uh, triple negative breast cancer and how it affects Black women here. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Carmen Jordan Cox. There we go ahead, unmute myself. Uh, the three issues that um, come to mind for me, one relates to uh, behavioral health and the type of partnership that we need to have between the police and our behavioral health specialists. Um, I think we can think of a lot of current examples uh, in our nearby states and certainly Jermaine in Delaware as well. When, when, what's the appropriate kind of partnership we need to have so that we're getting the right services in the right communities because they tend to, these the problem areas tend to affect people of color disproportionately. The second area is uh, food and housing insecurity among college students uh, from, from a number of national studies. 45% uh, of college students are food insecure 56% are housing insecure and 17% are homeless. And um, this, is, this is a real issue. And our, our Delaware institutions have also participated in the national studies and I certainly can provide the committee with the, the study that was done in the last couple of years, uh, if that would be helpful as, as a resource. And the third issue uh, that comes to mind is looking at 
perhaps some enhanced resources for the fam for for uh, for family services. This is kind of a nuanced issue, um, and and this comes from my days on 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 the bench when um, when juveniles come into the court system. Certainly at night, when when judges are having to set bail and decide uh, what is the uh, how to handle a juvenile who's been detained at night, uh, there's a liaison who makes recommendations to the judges, but the liaison only works until midnight. So that 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 liaison is advises the judges on, on what the bail conditions ought to be. But after midnight and before, when family court is not open, that liaison there are no resources available to have that liaison available. And I think we need, need to kind of look at look at that because. The judges really rely on that kind of information to help decide what's the appropriate placement for a juvenile. And again, a lot of the juveniles who come into the system are kids of color. So I know Thank this you. kind of spread all over the place, but. Uh, They're good topics though. Um, would you mind sharing that study on housing and food insecurity for- I'll, I, will, I will send it when I get off because it's on the other laptop. Yes. Thank you, that will be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, who do we have next? Eleanor Kiesel. Yes, hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this and um, uh, based on the discussions that we've had at the last meetings, um, I, uh, and these are not necessarily in priority order, but certainly mental and behavioral health um, treatment and intervention. Um, and um, the discussion at the last meeting was interesting because um, uh, a few people, and I, I don't remember exactly who it was, but um, talked about specifically separating out mental health from substance abuse um, and looking specifically at um, mental health and not lumping those together. So I think that's great um, to have one topic as specifically mental and behavioral health, but then as a second um, priority, substance abuse. Um, the um, overdose deaths, um, of uh, Latinx and people of color is really disproportionate, particularly in Delaware. And um, I, I don't know that we can leave that out um, from priority. Um, and then in, in terms of a third one, you know, I was thinking more in terms of really physical, um, physical health and um, certainly the um, uh, maternal health issues um, I think are important, but for that one, I, um, if other um, committee members have um, a strong um, view with regard to getting more specific with physical health um, disparity um, to look into it, I'd be fine with that. So thank you. Thank you. I, I think there's, there's room for, for maternal health and physical health. Okay, let's see. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Simone. Um, so the Metropolitan Women's and Urban League, um, we have a report called The Pace of Progress, basically 2.0, um, where we address, you know, health disparities, economic, education, criminal justice, um, housing, and then just the history of racial disparities in Delaware um, over the past 40 um, years. And um, some of the health disparities that um, we are focused in on uh, to make some changes on, of course, is the uh, maternal mortality um, crisis. Um, and then we're looking into specifically um, like requiring implicit bias training, um, expanding state Medicaid, um, and um, and looking into doulas and getting more, um, more um, buy-in for them in, in hospitals and then instituting a Medicaid buy-in program. Um, but this is all stemming off of addressing the health disparities such as um, um, the death rate for homicide and um, overweight and obesity and substance abuse and mental health, um, as our other subcommittee members have, have already mentioned. 
Thank you. What was the name of the, or what was the title of the um, program you were talking about? Pace of Progress. Um, it's a report that the Building People Power Campaign um, is, is using. Um, I can provide the link to um, a draft of the report. I'm, we're supposed to be releasing the report um, by January. That would be great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have Zebby Harrington, so I will move on to Cassandra Codes Johnson. Thank you, Representative Minor Brown. So I, um, uh, as Associate Deputy for Public Health, I actually submitted some comments in writing because I wanted to make sure I was respectful of this process for to discuss three. So I just want to enter for the record that I actually submitted in writing six um, priority areas, but the three that I'll focus on um, from my part of the conversation um, really come from conversations that community members have engaged me around that I think it's important to um, bring forward. And the first is um, when you think about um, how to look at root causes and how to really get down to how uh, some of the root causes of some of these disparities that everyone has uh, have listed. Um, and I've heard some, uh, some great um, ideas. Um, there are other states, uh, approximately um, 26, um, according to the American Public Health Association that have declared structural and institutional racism a public health crisis. Um, and this declaration seeks to um, elevate um, structural and institutional um, racism policy systems and practices as part of the underlying root cause for health inequities for um, African Americans and other communities of um, color across the nation, and that would apply to Delaware as well. Um, the the second uh, priority um, that has been raised is uh, looking at mandating um, ongoing um, uh, continuing education units, uh, CEUs, and training for both the healthcare workforce um, and the social service workforce. And social service here is meant in a broad term um, to encompass all state agencies that serve the public um, around implicit and unconscious bias training um, as a strategy to promote equitable access to and respectful treatment within these institutions um, for uh, communities of color. Um, and the third is also echoes um, uh, some of the other um, comments made by committee members and it is around um, an expressed need that we really need to look at improving the infrastructure and drastically increasing mental and behavioral health services for youth in particular in the state of Delaware um, with a specific focus on increasing access to residential treatment services. Thank you. Thank you. Now, would you happen to have those other three in front of you? Um, I do, if, if you want me to, I just wanna be respectful. I can run through the other three quickly if you'd like me to. Sure. Yep, so the um, additional three um, that I also shared in writing from a public health perspective, um, also echo some of the comments that I've heard from committee members. And the first one is um, a continued focus on looking at how to address our infant mortality rate and uh, uh, maternal health of uh, uh, Black women in, in Delaware. Um, infant mortality is looked at um, globally as an indicator of the health of a society. Um, and in Delaware, Delaware, our Black babies died a rate um, uh, two times higher than our, our white babies. And so I think it's already been expressed that the interest um, in that area of continuing to double down and look at strategies to improve infant mortality and also improve um, uh, maternal health outcomes um, is a need if you're looking at decreasing disparities for African Americans in Delaware. The next one was, um, and I've, uh, I'm pleased to hear that this next one seems like it's also bubbling up in another um, 
subcommittee. So that's, that's exciting to hear. And it's related to this idea that place matters um, and digging deeper into um, life expectancy data across um, uh, different Delaware um, communities and using um, that data kind of as a guidepost to um, point to where investments um, in African and African American communities are needed um, to um, help improve um, the overall health status in those communities. And then um, the third one, the last one, um, is um, around uh, a deeper dive into looking at the data tied to housing segregation policies and the impact um, on African uh, American families um, in Delaware, but also nationally. Um, I'm co-author of a document called Health Equity Guide for Public Health Practitioners um, and Partners. And in section three of that guide, and I'm happy to share the link later, there's a deep dive into data around um, housing segregation and those historical policies. And uh, data suggested that they are the root uh, cause or one of the major driving factors behind things related to um, inequities in a lot of spaces, education, um, environmental health and social justice issues, um, wealth gap and ability for upward mobility for African-American families. Thank you so much. Next up we have Mr. Forrest Watson. Uh, thank you, Representative Myron Brown, uh, and to the committee as well. I, uh, I, um, it, it's interesting to see how some of the the, uh, the three subject areas are, you know, sort of uh, aligning. Uh, I'm coming behind Cassandra, and mine is uh, pretty similar to Cassandra's. I uh, put mine into three categories, three major categories. One is the uh, what I believe is the substantive root causes of why we have the uh, health disparities, not only just health disparity, but, but the disparities in our nation uh, altogether. Um, and uh, so I, I, that's one, the root causes. And then I think the, the second phase of this, or the, of the second part of this is, I think there needs to be re-education. Um, and so we need to talk about that re-education part, part of that. And then the third part is the uh, is the infrastructure infrastructure focus, and the infrastructure uh, infrastructure focus. There are probably six components under that. So I start off a little bit about the root causes. Um, and in in my view, I think we need to take a review of the codification here in the state and in the United States. And what I mean by codification, I'm talking about the laws that came out of. Uh, and, and have, well, the laws that came and produced the, the disparities that we have. Um, I believe, and I've extensively researched that law and regulations lay this, frown, this, this groundwork for why, how we have the systemic racism. And, and my understanding of racism is really the codification of the, 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 the uh, distaste or the abuse and the oppression that you have against a particular uh, race. So when you codify it and put it in law, that really produces the racism. That's why I think in my view of it that black Americans or people of color in this country can't be racist because we have no power to codify laws. Uh, and uh, so I think there needs to be a review of the codification of laws that has, and, 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 and if I've done my historical research uh, is come out of white supremacy and racism is the outgrowth of that and all of the policies that come out of that. And we can, and we can take a look at all of those policies from, you know, from uh, miscegenation to housing discrimination, voting rights acts, what we have today in terms of voting suppression, all of that is rooted in white, in, in white supremacy and racism. And, and, and I think the issue is that most individuals in our country ascribe right, racism to overt acts of, you know, against particular individuals and don't understand the underlying pinning issues that have supported this country that racism 
is the foundation. So I think that if we can get to the root causes and, and, and do a, a review of the codification of these laws and take a look at the impact that these laws have, not the intention, well, the intention is clear, but uh, not the perceived intentions, the, the, the outcomes and what they generate, that's first. Um, then uh, in terms of the re-education, I think there need to be a full revision of the full real history of US, of the US and Delaware. And in that, I think that um, we need to do that at an at a, a institutional level and encourage uh, schools and higher institution of learning to do a full review of that. Um, and, 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 the, and the reason that is, is because when Racism and white supremacy exist, it nullifies the contribution of people of color. And because it nullifies the con contribution of color, as we educate throughout that, then, then, then people of color are null nullified in the education program in terms of history. So it, what that does is that when students of color enter into the educational institution, they don't see themselves. So they don't see themselves in any positive view uh, um, and so, and, and you know, we can see that throughout um, history as recently as Hidden Figures, which is a popular, a very impactful movie, which I knew nothing about. And I was ashamed I knew nothing about Hidden Figures. And here we are going to the Apollo, and I was all part of the Apollo mission, grew up during that period, and knew nothing about it. So the other part, and that's the institutional piece of it. The other part is that we need to bring education and illumination to individual citizenship, citizenry, because they need to know uh, how and how, what, racism, what racism is and how individuals participate in racism and how they extend the white supremacy myth. Uh, so I think there needs to be something there individually to bring some illumination there and to develop anti-racist efforts. And uh, so that's the re-education piece of it. Um, the, the third piece mental health way. Certainly the individuals that have been oppressed uh, and been nullified and dehumanized in, in really uh, are affected by it in a very real way. But it's also the individuals who are perpetuating the dehumanization because you can't perpetuate dehumanizing someone unless you lose something. And so, and in fact, so the perpetuator becomes a little bit more dehumanizing, dehuman themselves. And I think that's a mental health issue. And we end up seeing that in some of the opioid issues that are ravaging our community. Economic development is another one because all of the racist systems come out of economics and, and a desire to oppress and gain and split and uh, uh, rape and uh, experience significant economic gain at the expense of another, uh, another party. And we need to talk about that. And in hitting in that uh, are uh, banking and financial laws, redlining, et cetera, et cetera. It's so much, it's so massive that if we don't start with the root cause and continue with some of these other remediation efforts, we're not gonna get anywhere and we're gonna be discouraged. And I know this is a battle that we've got to face and I really applaud you guys for doing it. Women's health is a key part for me because as Cassandra said, women's health really, particularly infant mortality shows the uh, health of a community. And I was reminded by one gentleman that came and gave a presentation at one of the annual conferences, I think it was two years ago, I forget the doctor's name. And he was talking about the one period of time when the disparity between women's health or, or infant mortality between disparity between Caucasian America and, and African American clothes. And that period of time was between 1960 and 1985. And if we look at what happened between 1960 and 1985, there was significant review of the codification of laws to bring in inequality to a people that had been disparaged for many, many years. We're talking about the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. All of those laws tremendously uh, caused a, 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 a social or a, a revolution in, the, in, in this country. 
And I also want to make this, this is my own stuff I'm sticking in here and I may as well get it on tape, is the, is the, um, the idea of our music. Because during that period of time, music coming out of the African-American community transformed not only ourselves, but the entire United States and the world. And it seeped into Caucasian culture and it was embraced. And that, in, in that transformation, that really closed the gap. So we've got the closing of the gap occurred to those periods. Um, criminal justice reform is, is key. Um, housing and then substance abuse and chronic conditions. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. And I am hearing some of the same topics, and you know, I love that that we're we're hearing the same topics um, from everybody. I am going to move on. I'm going to um, welcome Mr. Keith Hunt to the conversation, but I will I will skip over Mr. Hunt, give him a moment to to get prepared, and I'll move on to Nikisha Williams. Thank you. So good evening. Thank you so much, Representative Minor Brown and the um, subcommittee. Just like you said, really cohesive with what everyone else is discussing, but I will tell you that I sit on several committees where um, we have repeated these things consistently, even in just this week. And I will say the top three in subject matters would be, as someone else, a couple people said, mental and behavior health. The subtopics of those would be, um, more opportunity or inroads in our school systems with our youth. And also the subtopic to that would be with um, police intervention and interaction. Second, um, food insecurity and housing, not just with school, but you know, really holistically. And women's health, particularly black women's health. And the subtopics under that would be maternal breast cancer and infant mortality. Thank you. Thank you. And next up we have Colleen Davis. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Representative Minor Brown, I really appreciate all your work here. And I saw that we also have Representative Johnson as well. Thank you guys. And uh, Representative Frank Cook, good to see you here. And, and to the, the entire subcommittee. Um, I, you know, I thought about this in a way, I, I think about when we're entering and exiting the, the healthcare system. And one of the, the areas that I think is very crucial and everyone sort of, I've heard this a handful of times is um, maternal health, but also paternal health. So I think that there's a, a congruence that, that uh, is there at that sort of crucial time. Um, and, and I think about it in a way of, you know, where do these biases come from? Why are, uh, why are individuals that are otherwise, you know, on paper appear to be exactly the same, but treated very differently in person, in human interaction? And I think about, again, those types of biases come from the human to human interaction. I, I really believe that that's where a lot of these, um, so, so I think about folks being sort of channeled in one specific direction or not having access to the same types of care. And I, I really took more of a focus on um, the, the healthcare system itself. So, so really sort of when are folks entering and exiting? And I think, you know, maternal and paternal health really should go hand in hand um, because a major event like a new infant uh, can be very stressful as well. And, and you know, those of us with uh, some background in, in uh, mental health, anytime there's a, a birth of a new child or you know, positive things like a, a new job, uh, a new home, uh, large purchases like that can be very stressful. And um, we, I think that there needs to be a space for, um, for um, mental health, as well as the actual physical care that should be coming in, you know, and, and we think about women in those times, 
but I think the the father also needs to be to be considered. Um, and I and I think that empowering men also will um, have a, a positive impact on um, on um, live birth. Um, it'll help to empower couples to uh, you know to to um, promote the health of their infants. Uh, and then I also think about again when are individuals first you know entering and exiting the healthcare system from the perspective of mental health. I think that there's a real opportunity to um, to to provide training for uh, frontline workers in that space. And that it would include not only, you know, our paramedics and our first responders, but, but truly our, our law enforcement. Um, they are often the first that are called when there is a major um, mental, mental health event that's going on with an individual. And so I think about um, that space and, and I think about the, the opportunities for training there. Um, and then the third, uh, the third area that I was, you know, really uh, trying to think about how we can be impactful in um, is, is again, sort of those, those other areas where folks are going to enter or exit the healthcare system, that, that um, we are sort of walking healthcare uh, workers um, across all levels through the process of breaking down biases and sort of just in the same way that we developed questionnaires around um, cancer risk, around smoking, around um, um, mental health. We, we created, you know, questionnaires uh, around um, um, abuse in the home, things like that, things that are always difficult to talk about and sort of open the door. Um, how do we help to create these avenues to break down some of those biases that start to happen um, and, and people may not be aware that they're doing it or, or may not be aware that they have you know, formed this story in their mind for this particular individual that is just seeking care and, um, and how do we you know, again, I, I think about it from the perspective of how do we break down those biases from the perspective of the healthcare worker and then empower uh, patients and families to ask questions, to be prompted to say more um, and to seek out the, uh, the actual um, resources that they need. So those were kind of the, the topics that uh, came to mind. Thank you. I want to welcome Representative Kendra Johnson, my co-chair, to the conversation, and Representative Frank Cook. Welcome to the conversation. Uh, next up, oh, let me welcome Ms. Debbie Harrington to the conversation. And Ms. Debbie Harrington, if you're ready, are you ready to share your three top priorities? Well, I am. Thank you very much. I apologize for um, being a little tardy, I, um, I had another meeting. So you know how it is, we just, we stay, we go from meeting to meeting. So, um, you know, really listening to, for as much as I could catch, I can't add much more to, to what everyone has said. Um, but I, I will say that just when, when I think about it, um, my top priorities would be first, uh, would be people with disabilities and, um, I, I do a lot of advocating for people with disabilities and I, I have that personal experience in, in my family. So, um, you know, I just think we wanna make sure that they have access to um, quality health care, and that, um, that their special needs or particular needs are, um, you know, paid close attention to. Um, and then uh, my second area would be, and, and people, some have already said this, but it is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, particularly as a result of COVID-19. And that is the, uh, the health issues that, um, that come from food insecurity and nutrition health. 
And so um, I'm very concerned about that. I think we, we have to, be, I think we recognize just how deep that problem, how severe that problem is um, after uh, COVID, as a result of COVID-19. And then the third issue is um, our environmental health um, from based on where we live and where we work, even where we work. Um, so that's a topic that I think we have to, uh, you know, we, we really should focus on that. For me, that is a priority. Uh, the, just looking at sometimes the types of jobs we tend to hold uh, cause maybe health issues that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. And so, you know, there are things that need to be put in place in order to, to make sure that, that we, we recognize that there is a problem and that we're able to do something about it. And then people have access to quality health to combat those things that happen in terms of environmental health. So those are my three priorities, people with disabilities, um, health issues around food and nutrition, and then in environmental health. Thank you. Mr. Keith Hunt, are you ready to share your priorities? I think I had to unmute. Yes, I am. Uh, I also apologize, Representative Mayor Brown, for my tardiness. I've been fighting my internet all day. I was on, off, on, and off, so here I am. Uh, <clears throat> I am going to come at this maybe slightly different. I, matter of fact, my three topics have already been covered uh, for the most part by other uh, uh, members of the panel, but I want to I want to try to I want to share them, but I want to put them in a little bit of context. And uh, I'm probably the, the least qualified in in terms of a healthcare professional on the subcommittee, but I I'm very well qualified as a as a change agent dealing with large system change, uh, and particularly in terms of dealing with um, systemic racism and large system change and transformation. And, and the point I want to make is this, without being too long-winded about it, is that uh, a, a lot of these uh, topical areas are, uh, are areas of medical practice that our medical health care system and practitioners already know how to deliver good health care around, whether it be behavioral health, uh, 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 maternal uh, cancer treatments, et cetera. The disparity is a big key word here. And that is the disparity means that there is a gap uh, in the uh, black and brown community around getting that quality of care delivered to that community. And, and I started asking why. And, um, and uh, so if we can acknowledge, we being universally acknowledged systemic racism, then uh, we have to carry that conversation forward to systemic racism in our healthcare delivery structure systems and processes being basically the hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities that that provide that frontline uh, service uh, and the years ago uh, there was a whole uh, hue and cry around cultural competency and uh, there was a lot of training done by a lot of consultants around cultural competency in terms of healthcare delivery uh, because there was there was an acknowledgement that there was disparity even at the emergency room door uh, in terms of the black and brown folks guy came in the door, they got treated differently than if other folks came to the door. And so cultural competency training was being put in place. So <clears throat> there was an acknowledgement there then. And so now we deal with this whole notion of bias uh, among uh, uh, and, uh, in systems and systemic racism biases, whether they be conscious or unconscious, uh, that, that gets in the way. But we know enough about cultural competency. We know enough about bias to, to be able to be intelligently able to overcome it. So why doesn't that happen? And why do we continue to have this, this uh, trend and lineage of disparity? Uh, because there are no consequences. And so when I look at this question of uh, priorities, then I want to look at it from the standpoint of as a subcommittee and, and as our uh, task force writ large, what are, we, what are we asking for demanding in terms of consequences around the delivery of healthcare as professionals already know how to do it? Uh, when we look at funding, uh, a lot of our hospitals and delivery systems get both federal and state funding. 
uh, why should they continue to freely get federal and state fundings at the same time of, of being disparate in their delivery system to black and brown constituents? Why is that? And so if we can then think about ways to activate people to deliver on what they already know by, by chasing the money trail, uh, then I think we have really leveraged this conversation to another level of, of consciousness and, and competency. And so uh, I'm, I'm interested in one of the topics being um, consequences for poor delivery or lack of delivery to uh, black and brown communities. I don't know how to organize or, or strategize on that, but I think that that is an avenue that, that needs to be approached in all of this conversation so that we don't keep having this conversation over and over again. If we chase the, to follow the trail to the money, hold people accountable with consequences around their funding sources, around their delivery mechanisms and, and delivery to black and brown communities, then I think we would start, start seeing people inside of those organizations dealing with bias training, dealing with uh, cultural competency training, dealing with delivery in a much more conscientious kind of a way. Because uh, they know how to do it, they're just not doing it because there are no consequences for doing it. So that's one element. And, and within all of that, um, you know, you know I, I look at the unequal tre treatment as being institutionalized, therefore. And so some of the areas that I like to, for us to pay attention to then is, and I may repeat some of the topics already board, but we're working with youth and parents of children uh, in closing the gap on sexually transmitted disease, uh, infant mortality, maternal mortality, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I look at these things from the standpoint of prevention. If, if we can, it, 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 there's a lot of discussion around uh, prison reform and um, uh, recidivism, et cetera. Well, m my whole notion around root cause analysis is prevent the problem of starting in the first place. So if I can get you to not go to jail, then I don't have to worry about prison reform as much. Uh, so if I can get you to not have health care problems because you've had preventive care, then I have to worry less about the cost of remedial care uh, and, a, and a destructive care or lack of care uh, in, a, in a stage four situation that people may find themselves in. This COVID-19, for example, opens the eyes very brightly. Why is it that black and brown folks, when they go to the hospital complaining about chest pain to a cost, they get sent back home and told to take an aspirin, whereas they really don't get a full examination. Why is that? So again, it, it looks at the biases that are inherent in the people that are delivering the, the healthcare because they know how to deliver it to somebody that comes in there that looks like them. And, and so we need to have consequences uh, to, to get them to pay more attention to folks that look like me and, and us and you. The other thing uh, in terms of preventive healthcare programs around some of the low hanging fruit, heart disease and diabetes. Well, you could say there's low hanging fruit, but it, those two alone hit us and impact us disproportionately. For healthcare, the United States healthcare delivery system that knows how to deal with heart disease, knows how to deal with diabetes, why is it hitting us disproportionately? Again, where's the money trail in terms of consequences for not giving us preventive care? and or not delivering treatment plans in our community. People know how to do it, they're just not doing it. Um, and then looking at, uh, uh, at that systemically then, I would like to see us uh, call the, uh, to task the healthcare providers upstate, downstate uh, in terms of their health and equity strategies. They know how to deliver it, let's call them uh, to, to task to tell us what are their healthcare strategies? What are they doing inside of their institutions to deliver? And, and, and what is their scorecard around delivering? And why is the score being what it is versus what it could be or should be? Uh, so let's have the CEOs tell us what their scorecard looks like in terms of delivering uh, within the black and brown community. And also in that same vein, have our Department of Health and Public Services, uh, Public Health tell us what their scorecard is in delivering to black and brown communities uh, in our, within our own state government network. So I'm interested in root cause. For me, root cause is a money trail. And so uh, with that in mind, I'd like for us to really kind of, uh, I, I would say, worry less about the intellectual approach of 
bias and, and treatment and follow the money to leverage money as being the opening and driving force for getting people to be accountable. And that's what we need, accountability for delivery, not, not understanding what to deliver. They already know how to do that. I, 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 I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, Representative Johnson, I know you joined us a little while ago, but I just wanna mention that, first of all, thank you everyone for sharing these great topics, these amazing priorities. We have a wide range of uh, topics here from black women and girls to physical health, mental and behavioral health, food insecurity, substance abuse. Um, let's see, um, implicit bias trainings and root causes and looking at the laws that actually uh, led to oppression. Um, so we have a lot of work to do and I can tell you now we'll probably end up um, having some working groups within this subcommittee. But, uh, Representative Minor Brown. Yes. Hi. Sorry about that. My, uh, <laughs> I went on mute again. This is Monica Shockley Porter standing in for Ray for um, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Um, I just wanted to, I had the pleasure of going first, so thank you so much for that. But I wanted to make sure that I highlighted the priorities as given from Ray, because she gave me very specific, if you guys know her, she's very specific. So um, she wanted to look at mental health, maternal and child health, metabolic a disease prevention, and then also disaggregated data collection by race, gender, income, and residence. So I wanted to make sure that those made the list because I know that you all are taking minutes for this meeting. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for that. So I just realized that we actually have to do a roll call vote on the minutes from our last meeting. So if, um, Let's see, do we have Valerie or? Um, Hi, Representative, this is Caitlin. Oh, there you go. Hey, Caitlin. Could you go back to the slide where we are going to do the acceptance of the minutes? We need to actually do a roll call. And so sure. for everyone here, here, that's even better. Okay, thank you. So if everyone doesn't mind, I'm gonna just call your name and if you could just give me a yay or nay on whether you accept the minutes from our last meeting, that would be great, thank you. I know we don't have um, Ray Jones Avery. And this is accepting the minutes um, with the um, corrections from Carmen Jordan Cox. Um, so I'm gonna start with Carmen Jordan Cox actually. Do you accept the minutes? Um, Aye. Go ahead. Aye. Thank you. Eleanor Kiesel? Accepted. Thank you. Simone Philpotts. Yes. Thank you. Debbie Harrington. Yes. Cassandra Coates Johnson. Yes. Forrest Watson. Yes. Keith Hunt. Pardon. Yes. Thank you. Nakisha Williams Bailey. Yes. Thank you. And Colleen Davis. Yes. Thank you. All right, now we have um, Representative Johnson here. She's actually going to move on to the deliverable slide. If you are ready, Rep Johnson, so happy to have you join us. Oh, good evening, everyone. So happy to be here. I am sorry that I uh, could not join us promptly at 5.30, but unfortunately I, I had to go and pay my respects um, at, at the service of a very dear friend. So um, it sounds like you all had some wonderful, robust uh, conversations uh, your topics. So that's, that's really exciting. I, I actually came in and I think I heard maybe the last four people speaking and I, I, I was, I was encouraged. And then uh, the, the icing on the cake for me was Mr. Hunt talking about accountability. And I'm like, that's how you wrap it up. We have all of these wonderful initiatives we'd like to see implemented. Well, after implementation, how do you hold folks accountable? So I will be keeping that in the back of my mind every step that we go. 
that for everything that we do, we have to think about how do you make this, how do you hold people accountable? Be that by their purse strings or by some other methods, but how do you do that? Because otherwise then we will continue the cycle of the talk. So thank you very much for bringing that up. So we're, we're now at our subcommittee uh, details. And while I was fortunate enough to hear maybe the last four people um, speaking, what I did hear, I think uh, Debbie Harrington said this, that um, some of the topics that, that she was interested in, uh, others had also had those same thoughts and feelings. And one of the things that Rep. Minor Brown and I talked about when we said, you know, listen, let's have folks have the opportunity to bring to the table those things that are of high priority to them. And then we're talking it through and it's like, oh my goodness, we could end up with a hundred different, you know, topics. And as we continue to talk, we said more than likely these things will begin to overlap and all things are going to be connected. And as Rep. Minor Brown shared, you know, and then moving forward towards creating working groups. So what I want, the, the last thing that I'd like to share with you today is, or this evening, is Rep. Minor Brown and I will go back into the lab and evaluate all of the priorities that you all have laid out for us. Uh, as you are aware, we also have meeting minutes. Um, more than likely prior to our next meeting, we will forward to you all, and I imagine folks are taking notes too, a total uh, comprehensive list of all of the priorities that the members shared during this meeting, okay? So that we are all on the same page. And then we will continue our discussion with, with refining those topics and moving towards our next steps. What I want you all to keep in mind, and this is not going to be a pop quiz for today, so don't worry, but keep this in mind. For the areas that you have uh, identified as being your priorities, I imagine that you may also know individuals who are subject matter experts. And we will rely on you to connect us with those subject matter experts. We will be, uh, we're actually in the process now, and I'm not sure if Rep. Minor Brown uh, spoke to it earlier, my apologies if you did, uh, of working out the logistics for a listening uh, uh, session for our task force. And with the listening session, you know, we thought, well, once we know the topics and we imagine that the members will know subject matter experts. That is how we will identify and engage those individuals. So just kind of homework for the next time, you know, or just something in your back pocket to think about for those priorities. If you have uh, relationships or contact with subject matter experts in those areas, please bring it to our attention so that we can all work together and, and, and make this work. Because each of us together will make this a impactful committee that is about action and getting things done, okay? I think that's all I have. Rep. Minor Brown, did I miss anything there? No, you didn't, Representative Johnson. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to mention one more thing, and that is in regards to a proxy. Um, if everyone could just start thinking about one person that could be your proxy, um, if there is a time when you cannot be at the meeting, we would like your proxy to be the same person every time so that they will, that person will know and understand what is being discussed in this meeting. So we would like your proxy to be consistent. Uh, I think that is that is it, Rep. Johnson, unless anyone else has um, any questions, concerns, thoughts, 
before we move out to um, public comment and questions? I think we're ready for a public, oh, wait, nope, there's uh, uh, Just real quick, I know we uh, outlined uh, Thursdays, but can you remind us for November, uh, are we are we on for Thursday for November in December? In what in December? Given the holidays uh, in, in there, I just want a reminder of where, where we are with the November de December. So I don't know if anyone else immediately thought, "Let's go check with Carmen." <laughs> I thought just that. I said, "Call." <laughs> we, we we changed to Wednesdays. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We changed to Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> I had a quick question, if if I could, before we move on. Did we want to answer his question first? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What is our? Uh, I know we. I believe we have a date for November. November eighteenth. Mm -hmm. And December sixteenth. Thank you. You're welcome. November eighteenth and December sixteenth. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Eleanor Kiesel? Yeah, sorry. Um, some of the things, some of the suggestions that were brought, well, all the suggestions were great, of course. Um, but some of the suggestions um, to me sound as if it could also fit into another subcommittee. Um, how will we know what other subcommittees, what the, their chosen priorities are so we're not duplicating effort? Yes, um, thank you for uh, asking that question, Eleanor. That was actually um, another part of the discussion that I was supposed to have. <laughs> so uh, what, and we spoke a little bit about this during the last meeting, but after we see the list, uh, the total and complete list, uh, Minor Brown and myself will also be touching base with the other uh, uh, subcommittee chairs to make sure that whatever we have on our list isn't overlapping. And if it is, we're going to bring that information back to you guys to let you all know that it's overlapping. Because I would imagine our task force got started a little later than others. So if others have already begun the work, we're going to let that be their work. Um, and then we will we will move forward. But that is also on our radar and we will be following up and bringing that information back to the entire committee so that you all are aware. Okay, great question. Thank you for reminding me because I completely forgot. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, then we can go ahead and see if there are any questions um, from the public. Okay, so if anybody would like to make public comment at this time, uh, please use the raise hand function to indicate that you'd like to make a comment. Right now we only have one um, a public attendee. So I'll just give that person a moment to hit raise function or hit raise hand if they would like to do so. Okay, so um, Gwen has indicated um, they'd like to speak. Gwen, you will have two minutes. I am going to unmute you now. You may begin, thank you. Caitlin, she's still muted, I think. I'm trying to hit on mute. I'm not sure what's happening. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I am Gwen Angelette. I um, am working on an initiative, uh, the uh, Delaware Racial Equity and Social Justice, actually the name is uh, changing a little, it's become a little simpler, it's a Delaware a racial justice collaborative. Um, Cause Condor Code Johnson told me about your meeting this evening. I was really happy to be able to participate or to listen in. Um, so many, many really good ideas were coming out of the 
out of the uh, committee members today. Uh, one of the things I noticed is there seems, uh, seems to be um, uh, a real opportunity, if you will, to um, uh, maybe uh, learn a little bit more about the, uh, how the, uh, this subcommittee could um, work with um, or at least align efforts with the, um, with the collaborative. There are a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between the, the topics of interest here and the topics that the collaborative is working on. Uh, Michelle Taylor is the, the, the overall uh, lead, if you will, for the uh, Delaware Racial uh, Justice Collaborative. Jamie Boone and I help her to make sure that the pieces of the puzzle come together. So um, I'm sure that there would be a wonderful opportunity to, to talk more if that would be of, of help and interest to the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Um, well, if you could um, send us an email with your information, that would be great. And you can email it to African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for your comment. Yes, we appreciate it. And the first thing that popped to my mind, Representative Minor Brown, while she was talking about uh, the collaborative is perhaps that's an opportunity to uh, have them come in and be a part of a listening session. It's just a thought. Absolutely. Uh, representatives, we don't have anybody else um, from the public in our Zoom webinar right now. So I think we can probably wrap up the public comment section. I did want to note, however, for subcommittee members that the next general African-American task force meeting is going to be happening on Monday, November 9th, uh, beginning at 10 a.m. And so um, during that meeting, there will be an opportunity for each subcommittee to give a report. And so that will facilitate um, a conversation about what each subcommittee is working on and, and whether there's overlap. Um, additionally, I wanted to point out that every general or subcommittee meeting of this task force is recorded on YouTube. So you can go back and watch any subcommittee meeting that has already happened. Um, you just have to um, search for the Delaware General Assembly um, YouTube channel. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that information, Caitlin. It's greatly appreciated. I think I will go back uh, so that I can watch the first half hour of this evening's meeting. How about that? Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, before we move towards closing, do we have any other task force members who have any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, um, would someone like to make a motion that we adjourn this task force? I'd like to say another early finish. Great job. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, let me just, I just want to thank Representative Cook again for being here. I know that you chair the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force. So it was great that you were here listening in, listening in and I know you heard a few things that are being discussed in your task force as well. We only had one person um, from the public watching and we must not be as popular as your task force. <laughs> your, oh, yes, you your public comment is always full, but that's okay because all of that leads back to healthcare. Yes, it does. <laughs> hey, I just heard somebody talk about Michelle Taylor. She's one of my uh, co-chairs of one, uh, one of my subcommittees. She don't play. And you know, also the, uh, uh, I have also the National Coalition 100, you know, like women in my in my uh, sub subcommittee, so you know health is not my thing. I go to you and Kendra for this, and and I see Miss Debbie uh, Harrington on here, and you guys are really doing a good job. And, and people are talking about this, and I know, like he said, and Mr. Watson, you're going to have to roll your sleeves up and get to the real truth about things. And we're going to hurt some feelings. Some feelings going to hurt us. Yeah. But you know. Yeah. You That's gotta right. get to work and come in with transparency and fact and truth. I'm on that with my task force. You know, I like to hear fact and truth because we can bend things and listen to people's narratives 
and, and making sure that, you know, we hit everybody. Like, like our, like our uh, Black Caucus says, justice for all. I care if you paint, blue, red, yellow, black, white, for all. So you're doing a good job. It was very interesting. Thank you. I just want to say Representative Franklin D. Cook, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women is also represented on this subcommittee. <laughs> if yeah, you yes, look in the are. squares, yes, yes, yes. you will see them. three of us. We are represented across all the subcommittees. Yes, just yes, you are. That's what I said. I said right. I have them on mine too. Yes. That's why I put your whole government name in the records. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Okay, I am done laughing now. I'm glad that I was on mute as I as I chuckled about that. So I am ready to entertain a motion that we adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. All right. Thank you all so much. It's wonderful seeing you. Thank you for your efforts and your energy and your commitment. Be safe and be well. Have a good evening, everyone. Good evening and God bless. Good evening. Good evening. Take care. Bye.